that's the thing. It, it, it's, you know, you know, it's ugly. You see it and it's like, am I brave enough to wear a Santa suit? And it's actually a suit. So cool. And uh, it's good. And you will not see me wear this any other time of the year. So enjoy. <laughs> and not even for Christmas. It's good. Mine actually says ugly sweater on the tag. That was the only way I knew it was ugly. And well, you see people wear these things all the time. And it's like, why would you wear that on purpose, Kathy? No, it's good. Kathy looks cute. It's good. You got your Bibles this morning? Go ahead and turn to John. We'll be in John and then you can put a marker on Ephesians. And I know that's hard to do if you have an iPad or or a phone or something, but you can figure it out. We're going to be talking about the man by the pool. And I think for a lot of people these days, you can relate to being the man by the pool. You can relate to uh, being hurting or having loss, having uh, stress, having things go on in your world. We see uh, stories of uh, people losing family members and people in tornadoes and terrible things happening, but how many know that God is still God? He's still with us, and He's still healing. He's still interacting. And you're still His favorite, and He knows how many hairs are on your head and how many hairs fell off your head this morning as you combed that you'll never get back. And He loves you. You know, he, he cares about you and he wants you to do good. I was listening to an interview on, on the news and you might have heard this interview, but these, this guy was, he was working at a candy shop and he might have been even the owner of the candy shop, but uh, the building fell down around him and he was talking to his wife and he happened to uh, have his phone um, after the building fell on, on him and he called her from the debris. And he was explaining that he's still alive, he's still there, and he's safe. And he thinks he's under like 20 feet of debris. So the whole conversation, she comes on site, and the whole building, this whole mall, is just devastated. And there's still people in there. And he's talking to her calm. He's like laying there in the rubble, talking to her. And she's trying to tell the firemen that... Hey, my husband's like there, like right. And it's just a pile. It's a building and they got him. They got him out and they dug him out. But how many of you know that, man, sometimes that's how life is, man, that you, you look around. It's like, how can there be anything good in that rubble of my life? In what you see, man, there's nothing that could have made it through that thing. And yet you still come out on the other side. And you're alive, you're still going, you're still breathing and still, you know, and that's the thing is it's still, there, there, there's still hope. Even when it looks like, man, everything is coming down and man, there's still hope when you have God. And I, I think sometimes we need to give that hope. Be, be, be someone that is, you know, telling people about the hope of Jesus Christ, telling people about the hope that we have in Jesus. Even in this room, I see people that have come back to church or come back to God, or uh, really even some that have never had a, a, you know, a life where they had, you know, church or, or, or God involved, and now they're here and they have God inside of them, and they have a new life and a new start, and it's exciting. That happened this year, their, their name might have been in that jar. And we were praying for that name and they were praying for that family. And, and now they're sitting in our church. And, you know, it's exciting. It, it, how many know that it, God loves the one? He wants the one to come back. And I, I'm just excited to see people going and, and reaching and, and giving the hope that, that is inside to others. But we see these, we see people sick. There's a lot of people gone today. I got probably nine calls of people that are sick. Some people got COVID and some people got just the gunk and, you know, they, you know, were sick and not feeling well and they're at home today and, and it happens. People get sick. People have disease. People are 
in the midst of their own struggle. Some people are at the point where they're losing their homes and jobs and all these things, and they want to see change. They want to get better, and some people don't know how. You look around this world and you see people that are depressed and down and stressed out and don't know what to do and don't know where to turn. And we need to point them to Jesus. Don't point them to yourself. Don't, don't say, hey, I'm your solution. I, I, you know, I'm your, I'm your Savior because Jesus is their Savior. So let's see what God's Word says in John chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the Pool of Bethesda, with five covered porches and crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed. They lay on the porches. See, one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? He said, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking, but his miracle happened on the Sabbath. See, when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he went to where the hurting were. He went to where the need was. He didn't run away from the need. He didn't go on the other side of the street. He went to where the hurting people were. That's where he was hanging out. And there were sick people with different problems. They all needed a physician. They all needed a healer. They all needed salvation. They all needed, it needed a change in their life. And I think that's the picture of us today. All of us. You don't have to be sick to need a healer or need healed. We all need Jesus. We all need a Savior. We all need to remember that God is there for us. See, I think even in our you know, religious behavior, we can get lost up in it and think that we're all right and we don't need a Savior. And we come to church and we, we put on our, our Santa suit. But how many know you could, you could hide behind your, your religious suit? You could look good and clean and comb your hair just right and come and, you know, you don't need God because you have your religion, you have your friends, you have your family here, and you can hide behind all those things. But we all need a Savior. The re rebellious people need a Savior just like the religious people need a a savior. Those that are messed up in life, those that are dignified and look like they have it all together need a savior just like the drunk needs a savior. The leader and those that hate Jesus, the wealthy, the bankrupt, the educated and the fool, they all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. We all need to change. It's just, are you willing to humble yourself? Are you willing to look up in the midst of your day and say, man, I need a Savior? Even in the midst of your good day, do you turn to Jesus and say, thank you, and I need you? But look what it says in the first four words of the sixth verse. It says, when Jesus saw him. Man, Jesus saw us this morning. When you came in the door, He was waiting for you. He saw you. He was like, yes, they're here. Man, they showed up. They're here again. See, just like when you drove in, man, and, and you went to your mom and dad's house for Christmas, they were waiting there. They were so happy to see you. It was, it was that type of love where, where, where God was looking and saying, man, I'm so glad that they're here. And you might need a miracle. You might need a healing. You might need to be set free. Don't look for someone else around you and say, man, I'm so glad that they're here. 
I know that they're hurting. Man, I know that that guy, man, he's a mess. I know his problem. I know his issues. But God's here for you. He's here for you today. So don't look and be like, oh, I'm glad they're here. Because that doesn't that take the heat off of you? Man, I'm glad that, I'm glad that Ray Lynn's here. You know, because then it, you're just the one now talking. And Ray Lynn's saying, man, I'm glad Pastor Devin's here. He needs Jesus today. See, you have to always look at you. God wants to take you somewhere else. God wants to take you on a journey. You've been there too long in the mess. You've been there too long in the place where you're comfortable. God wants to take you. Jesus knew how long he had been there in that condition. 38 years. God knows that you're desperate. God knows your circumstance. He knows that you're fed up. He knows that you're miserable. He knows how long you've been there. Some people in here that you haven't even been alive 38 years, and this guy was sick 38 years, sitting on a porch, feeling bad for himself, looking at other people that have come in and maybe got healed the first day. And he was still sitting on his porch, watching others get taken to the water. And Jesus asked him in verse, in verse 6, he said, would you like to get well? And what was his first thing that he says is an excuse, right? I can't. So the, the healer's there, the one with the solution. You know, it's like you need money and the guy with all the money, he's got the checkbook. He's, you know what I mean? He's the one that can take you out of your circumstance. He's like, no, I can't. And Jesus is looking at him like, well, there's a different way, buddy. You can. See, I think for some of us, we're looking to, to, to somebody to put the blame on. I can't be happy because my wife left me. I can't be happy because I had this happen. I lost my job. I was fired unfairly. I had something happen to me that was out of my control. And often we have that excuse, and it's the first thing that's out of our lips. See, I think when people have hope, and they have love, and they have God, that's the first thing out of your lips. And God is good. It's the first thing that comes out. But Jesus comes on the circumstances, he says, would you like to get well? And he's like, I can't. I'm going to be on this porch every day. I'm a spectator. I, it's not for me. See, when you ask people about their personal life, often they just give you an excuse of why they can't do something. When you confront somebody, it's always somebody else's fault. Something happened to them. But I believe we don't get our miracle because we never face the issue or the circumstance or the situation. We deny that we're weak. We deny that we're in need. We deny that it's us. And we start making excuses for why we are who we are. Somebody else did it to me. See, sometimes we hide behind our, our, our family, our religion. We hide behind our circumstance. We hide behind people that, that made stupid messes in front of us. Because it's true. We all had, you know... Parents that messed up. We all had, you know, circumstances that happened. We all had things. We had people that hurt us, people that abused us, circumstances that weren't your fault. But often we hide behind the mess and we don't get better. Just like Adam and Eve, they stood before God with their fig leaves in front of their nakedness and they were like, What? What happened? Where are you? What? And he's like, well, why are you hiding? Don't you think I've seen you in your nakedness? I created you. 
Why are you hiding? But they're hiding their nakedness before God. Often we try to hide our problems and we know that God knows. You know what I mean? It's like he was right there. <laughs> you know, he, he, he often is just looking at us in all our potential. You know what I mean? It's like we're standing there in all our shame. We're standing there in all our weakness. And he's looking at us saying, just take the step. Take the step and, man, come. Often we hide in the shadows in our shame and the enemy will come and say, oh yeah, you are nothing. You're no good. People are going to leave you when they know about your sin." But what happens when we confess our sins, not just before God, because we know that God's there and He forgives us of that sins and all in righteousness. But what happens with people when we confess our sin? We, we, we come up and we lay it out. We, we come and we confess our sins. Or, or, or you know a brother that he, he laid it out. He's like, yeah, man, I, I've struggled with this. I've, I've gone through this. People forgive. They, they, they generally get over it. A lot of people, like myself, forget all that you've done. Just through time. Man, if you come and you vacuum the church, that's what I remember you for. Honestly. You come and you rake the leaves with me. You come and you sweat with me. Man, I don't remember, man, the past of you messing up. I remember you me go, man, you saved me like four hours of work. That's how people are. People are very quick to forgive. Now, I think there's family that maybe have a harder time forgiving. Yeah, I mean, that is. We often, it's the, it's the one that are the closest to us that have the hardest time forgiving, but everyone else, is, it's pretty much people are like, oh, cool. I love that guy. You know, they're easy to forgive. But we want to not expose who we are because, you know, for one reason or other, maybe people think that you're perfect and you know you're perfect, so you don't want to any, have any shame come to you because then people would think, oh man, he's, he's not perfect. Wow, he's not. See, even though we get to the place with God where it's like he wants to renew us, make us whole, he wants, to, he wants to get us to that place where, where he knows how, how it is to be forgiven. And he's like, man, I see it in you. I need you to see it in you. I see you walking forgiven. Come and receive your forgiveness. See, often we, we, we have this gift in front of us and we don't want to open the gift. Susie knew she had to come up to get her prize. And she's like, I'm not going up there. I heard her behind me. She was right behind me. She's like, I'm not going up there. <laughs> everyone around her is like, you're going to have to go up and get the gift. And she's like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know? But it, it's in us. It's in our nature. I don't want to go and do that. Because what's the enemy saying? In Susie's ear, she's hearing from the enemy, if you go up there, you will die. You, if you go up, you will not make it back. You will go, something, heart attack, stress will get upon you. You're going to be up there and they will drag your body out because you will die. That's what the enemy's saying. So in her, she's like, absolutely, I will die if I go up there. That's all she hears. That's the only voice. Everywhere around her is like joy. It's like, oh, you won. Way to go. It's like wheel of fortune. or I mean, the price is right or whatever. Come on down. She's like, no, I'm not going down there. I will die if I go up there. But it's, it's one of those things where it's like, when you come to God, it's like, oh, I didn't die. Wow, I, man, I feel better. I, I, I think it's awesome when, you know, from the outside, it's like, wow, that person came to God. But from the inside, being that person that came to God, it's like, man, I feel so good. I watched this video on uh, YouTube. I showed Sherry. This is this guy getting baptized. Oh, it was so good. And he gets in and there's like three people. The baptismal is no bigger than our baptismal. And uh, there's this guy 
and there's a pastor in the water, and there's a, someone else that's holding him to give him support. And there, so there's like four people in the water. Well, this guy goes under the water, and when he comes out, he jumps straight up in the air, and he comes down on the pastor. The pastor goes underwater. He's like, he's drowning, and everyone else is like clapping and not looking. Well, the pastor is underwater. So this guy reaches, he's not in the bathtub, he's on the outside. He reaches down, grabs the guy by his neck and saves his life. Well, the pastor comes out just like, <gasps> like <laughs> so good. I, I don't even know how you would find it, but it's like, find guy get b- baptized or something. Not right now, don't look right now. But, but how many know that that's how it is? You come out and it's like, Man, it's a life-changing moment when God comes in and changes a heart, changes a life, and you, you drown the pastor. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Come on, that's good. Throw off your old sinful nature, and your former way of life. When you go home today, throw off that ugly sweater. (laughs) Put on something new and something that you're proud of. Old sinful nature and former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit, that's capital S, Spirit, renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature. Put on the new coat. Put on the new suit. Put on the new life created to be like God. Truly righteous and truly holy. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. That's good. It's almost like he threw us a curveball and threw the truth right in there. He wanted to get us all excited, like, yeah, I've got a new coat on. And then he's like, "Uh, yeah, don't let anger rule you. Oh, yeah. Anger rules me. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work. And then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing you that you will be saved by the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted. Forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Some of you need to go home and read that again. Highlight it. Dissect it. See, I think some of us need to not look at all the bad things because that's in there too. The bitterness and the rage and the anger and the harsh words and the slander. All the evil behavior. But you need to focus on what God's wanting you to do. Put your eyes on the things of how you treat each other. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God forgave you. See, I think we can sit and we can dwell and we can have our pity parties and make the excuses and tell you five different reasons why you can't, but I want to know what you're doing now. That when somebody comes and hurts you, are you able to forgive them? See, when you're somebody that is easily offended, 
That's what you're known for. You're, you're quick, quick to strike back. But I want to be known for being someone that forgives quick. Not that strikes back. When somebody hits you and strikes you, are you one? Man, I'm in the fight. I'll punch you back. You know, it's often, I mean, if you are stronger, it's like, you better not punch me. I'll lay you out. You know what I mean? It's an attitude. It's almost a, you know, it's, it, it, it's a posture that we take. You know, if I get hit, I'm going to lay you out. But I want to get in the posture of forgiveness where you put your hands down and you strike me, I'll forgive you. See, I think that's when God's working in you. That's when it doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you less than when you forgive somebody. It means that you're allowing Him to make you stronger. You're allowing Him to come in and lift you up. See, he was thinking Jesus could get him where he needed to go. Jesus, if you could just be here when the water bubbles and you take me down. See, he was looking at Jesus to get him where he needed to go, but Jesus instead was looking to him as the solution. He was the healer. He was the one. It wasn't just to get him to his healing. It was, I was going to use Jesus to get me to the place of my healing. I was going to get Jesus to take me to the place of deliverance. I was going to get Jesus to get me to, to the place where now I can prosper and have all my needs met because he's taken me to this place. Instead, Jesus is saying, I don't have to take you anywhere. I am your solution. I am your healer. I am where you find peace, where you find rest. I am the solution. I'm not going to take you there. There isn't an outside source. Jesus is the source. He is God. We, we have to remember that yeah, there's these, these times, these things in our heart where we're like, man, I, I need him to, to, to take me to where I can be better. Take me to the hospital. Get me to that place. Jesus is our solution. See, I believe that the man wanted to be helped. He wanted that, that, that change to be in his life, but he was looking for a place, a, a different course, someone to get him somewhere to get that help. See, people claim that church did not help them. Man, I went to that church. Man, they did nothing for me. I didn't get the help I needed there. But they came without a purpose. They were misdirected about what the church is all about. They were looking. I'm telling you, if somebody came, we, we've had a lot of break-ins in the church. They would have come on Monday. We would have given them money. We would have given them what they needed or what they at least thought they needed. But I want to tell you, if you come in and you think that the purpose of the church is to give, give you money, that's all you'll receive from the church. And you'll go away empty with money in your hand. But when you come to church looking to find the source, man, you won't even look to that money. You won't even look to that healing. You will be healed. You will walk in everything that Jesus is. But that's why I want to ask you, did you come today to get help? Did you come today seeking God for something? Did you come today expecting God to change you? Did you come to get saved? Did you come to be delivered? Did you come to get some answers? 
Why did you come? Because Jesus is here for you. Look no more. You can look into other things. You can look into the bottle. You can look into to, to, to the drug. And it, Will it give you satisfaction? Will it get you high? Yes. Every time. It will get you high. But you'll be empty on the other end. When you're done, you'll be empty every time. Jesus is the only one that can satisfy you, that can fill you. And when you leave, you will not leave empty. You'll leave full. You'll leave whole. But why'd you come? What did Jesus say to the man? Took him off guard, honestly. He threw out his best excuse. I can't. And I believe some people are sitting here. They're thinking, man, Pastor Devin, what you're saying sounds like a good thing. Sounds like a good idea, but I can't because I've been down that road and I, I know that I fail every time. And what did G Jesus threw him a curveball, didn't he? Jesus said, rise. Rise. What, what does that mean? What does that mean to us today? It means you're already healed. It means it's done. What you're looking for is done. What your greatest need is done. He says, rise. You know, there's a doubt in it where it's like, what? You know, you see me, I'm crippled. He says, rise. Stand up. It's already done. You're already whole. Just rise. Take up your bed. Come on, rise today. Stand up and walk. Show others what God has done in you. Stand and do it. God's in you. He's paid the price. See, his healing was immediate. His healing was, was, was already happening. See, salvation is not a process. If it was a process, it would never be completed. Because every time you make a mistake, every time you do something dumb, you'd have to go and get saved again. It's already completed. God can do it in an instant. If it was up to me, man, I'd take a lifetime. It would take forever. God says, rise, stand up, grab your mat. Get on with your life. Bring me with you. Did you come today expecting something? Did you come today to get help? I want to tell you, God sees you today. God sees you and you're hurt. God sees you today and he's saying, rise. Take up your mat. Take up your hurt. Take your disappointment. Pick it up. Take up your past. And he's saying, stand, take your mat and walk. Today is your day of healing. Today is your day of change. Today, you can start your new walk with God. Rise today. Amen. Let's stand. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for your touch, God. God, we thank you for those hearts that are open today to receive from you those words. Rise, take up your mat and walk. God, I believe that it's a matter of trust that we trust you today, God. God, as our past is in our hands, those things are in our hands, God, that we We look to you, God, for the future. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the miracle. If that's you today, if you 
came in needing healing, needing something from God, needing a miracle from God, needing God to show up today. I want to pray a prayer. And if you believe that that was you, I want you to repeat after me this prayer. Jesus, I trust in you. I want you to be my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start. Come and live in my heart today. I give you control. Thank you, God, for saving me. Father, I pray right now for every heart, God. God, every changed heart, God. Those that have risen today. God, those that have stood out of the place of despair, stood out of the place where they were in their hurt, in their sickness, and they stood, God. Father, we thank You for not leaving us. Leaving us on the porch. But God, You are looking for us today. God, we praise You and we thank You. You're a great God. Father, we just love You for giving us those second chances, but God, that you loved us first. And God, I thank you for those hearts that are changed today because of you. God, we love you and we praise you. Father, we just thank you for those kids down in Kids Church, God, and the same message that's going out today. God, let their hearts be changed. Let their hearts be molded, God, towards you. Father, we thank you even for the nursery kids and the babies, God. Those prayers that were, were spoken over those babies. Father, we thank you for those lives changed. Father, we love you, God. We thank you, God. Father, be with your people today as they go. God, as they go home, God, let them have new purpose in their walk with you, God. Let them give away that, that, that old that old ugly sweater, God. Let them walk in the newness that is you. Father, we love you and we praise you, God. Be with your people today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. If you do need prayer, please come up. We have the altar.